Dear viewers, wherever you are, hello and welcome to this new episode of your program, Spectra. After two extremely long years because of the COVID-19 pandemic that drained the world economically, psychologically, and physically, the world thought that this nightmare is finally coming to an end. But unfortunately, it was only the lull before the storm. Because just as we thought that this pandemic is over, at the beginning of 2022, we all witnessed a lot of tensions in Eastern Europe, in specific at the Ukrainian-Russian border. These tensions were followed by skirmishes and finally, Russia attacked the Ukraine in February of 2022. This war, again, brought to mind many old memories that the world thought we'll never think of again. It brought to the mind the Cold War between the East and the West, brought to mind again the Cold War between the Warsaw Pact and the NATO. On the other hand, Tensions are rising in the Far East as well, as North Korea threatens to use its warheads, nuclear warheads, against neighbors like Japan and like South Korea. Also, there is a possibility of China attacking Taiwan. To delve into the crypts of world policy, in this year and in the future. I'm really delighted to be accompanied by a young but very special political analyst, Lara Alderaini. Lara, hello and welcome to the program. Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So to start off, Lara, uh, both the Ukraine and Russia, both of them claim to have the right in doing what they're doing right now. So in 2014, Russia took the Crimea, and it's a peninsula, but it's a very, very strategic one. And when Russia did that, they thought that we're just taking what is ours. But of course, the Ukraine thought that Russia is taking part of their land. Later on, Russia claimed that uh, when they're not really attacking the Ukraine, but they're protecting Russian citizens who are living in the eastern part of the Ukraine, the Donbas region, to be specific, and they were prevented to speak Russian. They were oppressed because they're Russian, and they accused, you know, uh, the Ukraine of being... Um, home to a lot of new Nazis. Um, so on the other hand, the Ukraine says no, actually. Um, um, the Ukraine is not the daughter of Russia, but it's the other way around. The city of Kiev was the pivot, and it was the cradle, and it, it witnessed really the inception of the Russian Federation. So uh, do you think that both claims are equally valid? I think that it's very hard, obviously, to see one side as correct and one side as wrong, because both sides are able to present a viewpoint that if you come and, you know, view it from a third perspective and try to be neutral about it, you can kind of resonate with what both sides are saying. However, for Russia to completely base this notion of the Soviet Union built or created Ukraine, I think is a very oversimplification of history. And Ukraine has a lot of justification itself to say that, no, it's actually kind of the opposite way. Ukraine is the one that witnessed the Soviet Union. And if anything, Ukraine was the driving force for the creation of the Soviet Union, right? So both countries are obviously going to see themselves as correct, and they're going to see themselves as legitimate. But through history, we've seen so many parts of the world that have had independence kind of like at the core or the center of tension. And what it really comes down to is 
if there is this population of people that are willing to essentially die over and over again for this sovereign country that they see as Ukraine, then there has to be a legitimate question of is the Ukrainian identity more than what Russia is trying to get us to accept or see? Okay, so going back to um, the war on the ground, really. Mm -hmm. So um, Russia's Gazprom, this giant company of natural gas, they made a special song for Europe. And the song basically says, see you after winter, if you're still there. So Russia is really depending on, you know, the war of nature. Mm -hmm. And nature and winter have always been siding with Russia, starting with the time of Alexander the Great, Napoleon, and finally Hitler. Mm -hmm. So do you think that things will change tremendously after the winter? I think that winter is actually a very key... The weather is a key component of this because Russia is kind of engaging in what a lot of people call energy terrorism, where they're targeting power plants specifically. They want to cut off heat. They want to cut off electricity. They want to cut off basically civilian access to things because that is what's going to create the biggest impact. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to apply pressure. So definitely, I think, you know, Russia, as you said, has a strong history of being able to work hand in hand with the winter. It's not something that really is a threat or... Um, intimidating to them. Ukraine, however, being a much more a brand new, if you want to call it that kind of like sovereign in itself, I don't think it has the infrastructure to handle both the pressures of natural winter and the kind of energy terrorism that Russia is engaging in to put more pressure on them. So I definitely think that the winter can be a great defining factor as to where this war is going and hopefully maybe resolving or ending one way or another. Okay, so um, if we go back again to the Russian perspective, they're saying that mm. basically the Ukraine is our backyard. Mm. And uh, having NATO, um, you know, at our borders is a major threat. So mm. we're just defending our sovereignties by mm. uh, preventing the Ukraine uh, to be part of the NATO. But on the other hand, some analysts would say, hey, you know, like... Um, the Warsaw Pact broke back in 1991. And, um, you know, um, the different Russian presidents at that time, starting with Mikhail Gorbachev, who started the perestroika, and then uh, later on, Boris Yeltsin, um, they did nothing really to oppose the NATO or the West. And uh, during that time, we witnessed war in in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, like the former Yugoslavia was split, and uh, like there isn't a, there is hardly any true intervention of Russia in this war at all. Mm -hmm. We've seen the war in the Gulf and whatnot, and nothing happened. So, but Vladimir Putin came to power at the beginning, at the turn of the century, really. Like he came. To power and uh he played you know um this musical chairs game with uh medvedev but um even when medvedev was the president but vladimir putin was always the de facto president he was always the puppeteer really mm -hmm. and, you know medvedev was no more no more than a puppet so people are asking like why didn't you move starting in 2000 or like after that why did you wait for 22 years to make mm -hmm. um you were promised by the west the american prime minister at that time promised the the russia actually after the split of the soviet union that the nato will not expand and it will not include any former members of the warsaw pact which mm -hmm. is exactly the opposite of what happened so what took the Russians and specifically Vladimir Putin so long to make the move? Mm -hmm. I think, honestly, so going back to that point, I think there is a justification to saying that having NATO on my border is a direct threat to me. And I think that Ukraine may have taken that a little lightly. They didn't really realize that what you are essentially saying to Russia is, I have one of your biggest 
opponents through history and one of your biggest threats to your existing political and economic like structure and way of life and civilization right here in your backyard, as Russia calls it. So at any moment, if things go awry, there's a force that can act right away. Because we always have to remember that U.S. and Russia, geographically speaking, is not a war that can be fought without proxies in the middle, without, you know, the advanced warfare we have now through technology and biogenetic and so on and so on. So I think Ukraine really did take that decision lightly. And I think the reason it took Putin so long is because we also saw a change of government in the U.S. as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that that does play an essential role, that with every leader that comes into power, other leaders kind of have to play the field of how committed are you to this allyship? Are you going to stand by the word of the people who came before you? Can I trust that you are actually someone who is interested in keeping this peace or are you going to kind of pull the trigger at the first opportunity to advance? And I think that's kind of what got Putin a little bit on edge in that sense. It was like you get, like to him, it was almost like Ukraine is you're getting a little bit too close to someone that, you know, you shouldn't be getting in bed with, essentially. So I think and I, I do think that that is a legitimate threat that it's maybe the reaction was a little bit extreme and a little bit fast thinking. I don't think Russia really or Putin himself really thought it out completely he kind of just made the decision and had to stick with it as time went but it was a legitimate threat it was something to raise you know concern and a flag for the russians okay so now again going back to the western rhetoric like uh, some people think that vladimir putin is actually a new hitler in the making because back in world war ii like before world war ii actually so uh Adolf Hitler came to power in sort of a democratic manner. Like he did not create a coup or like he came, but he really gave the Germans what they needed at that time. They had a very low morale, the, you know, like mm -hmm. the economy was down the drain. Everything was terrible. So they needed confidence mm -hmm. again. And uh, they felt that they were like sort of, you know, really uh, exploited by the winners, by the allied forces. And, but when he started his, you know, like dream to conquer the world and whatnot, he annexed Austria, you know, and then uh, went to France, which he called it his living room, and so on and so on. It continued, continued, continued. Um, and the West did not really officially move until he came into Poland. And at that time, it was said that they were following an appeasement policy. So just trying to appease him, let him have this, let him have this, and, and so on. So the West are saying now, if we let him have the Ukraine, then nothing will stop him to go and take Poland and, 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 and so on. Uh, do you believe that the West is right here? Is, is really Vladimir Putin a Hitler in the making? I mean, I think that comparison is a little extreme in itself. But I see where, well, first of all, both sides, I think, are playing a big game of propaganda. So in the West, they're playing this big propaganda game against Russia and Putin himself really as the focal point of that. And in Russia, they do the same with the whole, this is the West and they're trying to take away our way of life and they want us to be just like them and et cetera, et cetera. However, I mean, with Ukraine, we do see in history that they have taken a lot of the brunt of the negativity in Russia whether it be when Stalin was trying out his whole uh, government control of agriculture and the famine occurred, Ukraine was the one that took the brunt of all that famine. When they had an incident at one of their atomic nuclear plants, it was the Ukrainian people who were suffering, you know, the aftermath of all of this and they weren't even notified. So I can see where the West is kind of like, there's a history of this, not just worldwide, but within you, like to Ukraine itself directly. However, that... The reason I say it's an exaggeration is because Putin grew up in the 1970s at a time where the ideology in Russia really was that Russia and Ukraine are one. And if anything, they believe that it's the word of God for them to be one, that, you know, according to Christianity and we join Christianity at the same time and we're supposed to be one country all under one rule, et cetera, et cetera. So I think for them, they really do believe like Putin himself really does believe that Ukraine is supposed to belong 
to Russia and you're trying to directly not just threaten that relationship, but also threaten me directly by saying that, oh, well, we're now taking Ukraine under our wing as a NATO, the same way we are doing with Poland. And it's almost just history repeating itself where the West is really just trying to legitimize its claim over somewhere else. I mean, because most of the time we always ask this question of why are you invading someone else's sovereignty and making these international decisions about diplomatic relations that actually have nothing to do with you? But it's kind of just an extension of power, right? It's the same way how they have NATO kind of based all over the Middle East or wherever else it is they want. They want to know that if Washington gives out a command, you can't say no because the response is you're under our protection. Like you have this protection because of us. I mean, through this war already, we see that Ukraine is indebted how many millions or billions to the United States at this point, because that's the only reason they're able to keep going and to keep fighting is they have the U.S. backing them, which in turn gets the Europeans to back them, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of this back and forth of is what he's doing right? No, of course not. You are targeting a specific group of people, which, again, it is why they probably try to draw that Hitler comparison. But I don't think it's on the same scale because you have these external powers that are kind of egging on this war because they directly benefit from it. The U.S. being the prime example here. And um, so, again, you know, talking about proxy war, um, many people here, again, they're seeing that uh, the Ukraine is no more than a bait, actually, for Russia. It's just a way to drain Russia. Mm -hmm and to have a stronghold in Eastern Europe. Because regardless of what the outcome of the war is, if they sit on a table for peace, probably Russia will demand to keep the status quo. Russia will never back up. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. They will not capitulate. There is no way that they'll give up. So they'll keep what they have. And... On the other hand, the animosity will stay between both sides. So the West will say that, okay, um, there's the Russian bear at your borders all the time. So the only way for, for you to be protected is to be a very strong ally of us. Mm -hmm. If you say no, if you have other ideas, then good luck with Russia. So is the Ukraine like in really the, the put themselves between the hammer and the anvil? I truly believe that they did. At the start, when I was saying that Ukraine really didn't think through this decision and the consequences of it, I really think that that's what happens because they've kind of put themselves in between a rock and a hard place, as we say, where it's how do you come out of this? The whole point for Ukraine was you want it to be your own sovereign nation with your own political structure, your own civilization, your own economic existence. Like You want it to be you. You want it to be Ukraine. Well, now it's kind of like if you back down to the Russians, you know you're going to have to go back to being Russian, which is what you fought for, like against this entire time. And if you let the Americans carry you through to the end, you're now just another it, kind of this modern form of imperialism that we see. It's not the way Great Britain used to conquer the world as we saw before. This is now how can I indirectly have my foot on your land and that's exactly what nato is and that's exactly what ukraine is to them now they are essentially as you were saying they're just a ploy for them to get to russia at this point they don't really care what happens to the ukrainians they don't care about the aftermath they don't the only person really taking the worst of this is ukraine they're the ones infrastructure is falling apart the europeans are trying to back ukraine up for the us and their gas prices are going up our gas prices are going up the united states is self-reliant so they're not seeing that influx the same way we are so really they're just kind of sitting there laid back watching all of this unfold and they don't get impacted irregardless so definitely i think ukraine was a very strategical move for them to be like we're getting everything we want without having to suffer the consequences and i think ukraine was so into the idea of gaining independence and being its own sovereign nation that they didn't realize all they did was go from one hegemon to another. So is this another, um, you know, second Gulf War? Is this another Iraq and Kuwait? Because again, um, a lot of people say that actually, uh, you know, both Iraq and Kuwait were tricked by the West, both of them. 
So Iraq got this message that if you invade Kuwait, we'll be neutral. We're really indifferent. And then, of course, there is, you know, now Kuwait uh, and all the Gulf, actually, their only way to protect themselves against any eminent threat coming from Iraq and now Iran is to keep permanent military bases mm -hmm. for, for the West and the NATO. So um, this might be the future of the Ukraine as well. I definitely agree. I think that that's exactly where it's headed. It's It really just is, like I said, it's just another form of imperialism. It's just, this is my way of taking over. This is my way of kind of egging on the communists with this, here's a neo, a soon to be neoliberal country right at your border. Because whether Ukraine likes it or not, if the US carries them through, you are just another part of their neoliberal plan. At the end of the day, the US, everything for them goes back to the status quo in the international realm, the global policies, economics, how all of these things interact with each other. The US is never going to let Russia claim any kind of victory because now you're talking about a victory of one ideal over another. Mm. We, we're, we're taught in this current like system that we're in that the West is you know the top. The West is what leads globalization. It with, leads growing markets, consumerism, all these things, the capitalism in itself. It's all coming from the West. So they're never going to back down. And now really the Ukraine has just kind of put itself in this position where it's going to be exactly what the Gulf is. It's just a permanent military base for the U.S. to have its power hold to make sure that it's not going to have to say, I'm going to launch a nuclear missile at you. I don't have to do that anymore. I'm right at your border, threatening your ideologies, threatening your way of life, and even threatening your security. So I really do think we're seeing another version of that war unfold before us. And do and you think uh, they'll follow the same path here again? Because it's not only Kuwait that asks for these military bases, but all the Gulf. Now we've seen like Finland, who tasted like, uh, you know, the Russian invasion before, and uh, other countries in Scandinavia as well, they're considering that. So do you think mm -hmm. it'll be a, a much wider spread, actually, of NATO? I think that there's a possibility of it happening. I just think that, countries might be a little bit more cautious of that now because we are a lot more inter interconnected than we were when the Gulf War happened. And so every country, when it's making these decisions, its allies or the people that know they're going to be dragged into the aftermath of this also kind of have a say. You know, like I think a lot of countries are going to be like, hey, we've already suffered economically so much because of this war. We don't know how much more we can suffer. I mean, even us here living in Canada or even people living in the UK, wherever it is, we're all seeing the economic effects of this war. And we even remember a time when simple things like I want to go buy a car. Sorry, all of this is, you know, not available to us because of the war in Ukraine. Everything is because of the war in Ukraine. So I think for them, it's if they start to see that kind of echo go across, the United States would have to make a very, very solid case to all these other allies that are going to suffer as well, that they're going to be OK, that they're not going to suffer more, that they have a good enough reason to continue backing them. Because, again, while the U.S. is a superpower, there's only so much it can do alone. Right. Like it was relying so much on the EU being like, we're going to cut off, uh, you know, Russia and place sanctions and all of these things to really push that. Russia needs to back down. They need to know that they're not going to win. So if they don't have the full support of the global community with them, I don't think it's going to continue on. And I, I, my hope is that that would be the deterring factor, because with the spread of NATO will come the spread of more conflict. The East isn't just going to sit back and, you know, like what we call the global South, while they are kind of quiet right now and trying to play it safe. Eventually, if it does lead to a spread, these countries are going to have to start speaking up, like China, for example. Okay, and um, you know, again, the spread of of NATO at you know the the borders and whatnot. But this coalition actually is sort of falling apart now because, like we're saying here, like a country like Germany, they had Nordstrom, they, they like they had excellent relations actually with Russia. And mm -hmm. but they just found themselves dragged into a war here, and and it it has a devastating effect on them. And uh, we've now we're seeing Hungary again backing up and saying mm -hmm. no, like you know. It's, it, and now there are a lot of uh, accusations for Hungary that they're being pro-Russian. 
more than pro-European or pro-Western. Um, so we have two different kinds of systems here. So the West is, you know, a coalition of democracies. And a democracy is uh, like, you know, people living in a democracy, they're always consulted and there is something called the parliament there. Mm -hmm. So um, the more the citizens of the West suffer, they'll exert incredible pressure on the decision makers to halt, to stop. While mm -hmm. on the other hand, Russia is, of course, it's not a, it's not a democracy in any way. Um, just like you said at the beginning, there is a common history between Russia and the Ukraine. We have Saint Olga. Saint Olga, uh, she was the one who brought Christianity to both Ukraine and Russia and whatnot. And um, a lot of Russians actually do not like what's happening. And and there's a lot of you know connections, you know family connections as well. A lot of kinship between Russians and Ukrainians, but. Russians cannot exert the same pressure on their government the way the West is, the, the Western citizens can. Do you think that the presence of democracy on one side and the lack of it on the other will play a major role in, you know, giving Russia an upper hand at the end? Yeah, I definitely think that that is one of the key factors. I mean, even in the beginning when the Ukraine war had just started and we remember seeing so many Russians of the younger generation going against the actions of the government, they were shut down. And again, that's because they're not in a democracy. It's very easy to, to exert censorship. It's like whatever the government sees is going to be threatening to their position and their power and the security, essentially, they will just shut down. They have no problem silencing um, those opposing voices. Whereas on the other side, the people can easily say, hey, we're not okay with suffering the aftermath of this war that you're trying to wage. We don't think it's necessary. We need to put a stop to it. In the West, there is this fear that if you don't have enough support from the people, you will not be in power again. And that's kind of what forces them to listen. Whereas on the other side, it's kind of like, oh, they don't like what's happening. Well, too bad. <laughs> this is where they live. And this is what, you know, is, is being told. And this is what's going to happen. And they don't have to, you know, revert back to anyone's decision. So ultimately, if it does come to a point where the decision has to be taken, do we go further? Do we exert more power? Do we create a spread? I think that there will be pushback. Um, as you mentioned, a lot of countries already are saying we don't want to be a part of this. And we're so easily in touch nowadays. You don't even have to be someone who watches the news. You just hop on Twitter and you already know that, oh, the people in Germany are saying they don't like the war. Well, I don't like the war either, so I should speak up. So that kind of interconnectedness that comes with that democratic globalization that occurs can really have a huge say in which way the war goes. And um, on the other hand, again, we have um, other very strong countries like China. So China has been playing a you know, major role in world economy and world politics recently. And there is this sort of cold or very subtle conflict that comes to the surface every now and then between China and the West or China and the US. Um, again, China tends to have good relations with North Korea. And North Korea is definitely a dictatorship. China is not a democracy in any way, too. It's a one-party country. And, um, you know, especially after Donald Trump. So Donald Trump had, you know, these this very pragmatic uh, kind of behavior. He met with the North Korean president, with Vladimir Putin. He had no problem sitting at the table with anyone and making sort of a business deal. Mm -hmm. So today, um, do you think that China might take advantage of everything that's going on between the West and, you know, Russia and to try to really, um, you know, play a more pivotal role in, in world politics? And because China is now dreaming of creating the Silk Road again, the mm -hmm. old Silk Road, but it's, it's even a modern Silk Road with more capabilities and at a wider scale. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Do you think that this would be the best time for China? Do you think that China might take advantage of this? So I think that the reason China, so we know that China and Putin had met right before the war was launched. And China did say that, hey, we're going to take this stance to support all foreign decisions made by the Russian government. It's kind of this agreement of I'm going to back you no matter what you do and I'm and vice versa. However, China hasn't shown any tangible or physical support for Russia in the sense that the Ukraine has the U.S. to provide it with military power when it needs it. Now, if Russia were to say, I need help with military, I need help with physical power, China doesn't seem to be acting in a way right now where it would lend that. It's kind of being politically ambiguous. And I think it's because China doesn't want Russia to owe them any favors just yet. I think China is really evaluating its relationship with the West. It's trying to see how far it can push its boundaries with the West. It's trying to see what's going to happen with Taiwan. It's trying to see all these important decisions for them. And I think if they are to see that the U.S. is going to start impeding on their personal uh, you know, affairs and things that they actually care about for themselves personally, then they will help Russia. Because at that time, they know that should the situation be reversed, they can look at Putin and be like, well, we helped you out at that point. So now it's your turn to you know, return the favor. That's kind of the agreement there. So I really do think that should it need be, China will act, but only for self-serving reasons, not because it's trying to maintain this status quo, because I think they, they know that they're self-reliant enough that they don't have to act yet. And do you think that like the, there's talk about annexing Taiwan, do you think that's for real or is just a litmus test? Honestly, I think it's been going on for so long that it's so hard to judge we don't it's for example china's like okay in 2020 i'm gonna up my military presence in taiwan because i'm fearful that the u.s is going to kind of try to make its move and then taiwan is like okay well i'm gonna up my military power because china's upping its milita military power and then the u.s is respond so it's kind of like they're all just playing this tag game with each other and you don't actually know who's serious about what action it's all just it's a reactive process as opposed to an actual intended one. And um, again, you know, when this war started, so we have Japan and we have Germany, uh, mm -hmm. both countries that lost World War II. And um, okay, they were like, uh, Germany was divided by, between the East and the West. So Berlin was divided through the Berlin Wall into East Berlin. West Berlin, so East Berlin was the capital of East Germany, and then Bonn was the capital of West Germany. Japan stayed as one entity, but it was an ally to the West. But in in both cases, um, like there are a lot of you know constraints that were put uh, on the military, so mm -hmm. they must have a very limited military power. So now there is a lot of talk about allowing Germany to expand its military and the mm -hmm. same thing for Japan to be able to support the, you know, this, this war, the, the war between the West and, the, you know, the East or the far or the Orient, really, the Far East. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that such a move might backfire? Because until today, like in Japan, in 2022, they're still producing movies and cartoons about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. Yeah. And it's it's they still have a grudge. Mm -hmm. Definitely mm -hmm. Germany has a grudge. Mm -hmm. So they lost World War I. They had the Versailles Treaty, which was extremely unfair to them. And then they went into World War II. They lost it, and they were mistreated and so on. Do you think mm -hmm. that it's time for revenge for both Japan and, and Germany? I think that both countries have been waiting for their opportunity for revenge. I think they do a really great job of, you know, our history, our history, and like always just kind of referring back to our history. And it's funny because with Germany, when it comes to certain instances, they're like, we don't want to remember our history, right? Because of how horrific it is. But then when instances, they're like, but we've, you know, been dealt the lesser hand, we haven't had the equal opportunity. And if so-and-so hadn't played out like this, we would already be on that 
higher level that we're trying to get to. So I definitely do think that they're trying to settle the score here. As for it backfiring, I definitely think it will. I think the world is a lot more interconnected than it once was. I think allies are actually a lot more interconnected. And it's not even for reasons of allyship anymore. It's because everyone is so dependent on everyone else for their economy, for their growth, for their stability, that it's not as easy to kind of turn your back on someone, let's say, oh, okay, the West could possibly give me better economic potential. I'm going to go against, you know, the global South that I've been bonded with for so long. Everybody's trying to maintain their economic status while also maintaining their political ideology. Nobody wants to have to sacrifice that. So I definitely think it will backfire with for them, but I, I think they're waiting to jump at the opportunity. Um, okay, how about the future of the Middle East? Do you think that, you know, of course the Middle East um, was and will always be probably like, you know, it is the center of all action. Like since the dawn of time until today, the Middle East is the north of Africa, the south of Europe, connecting, you know, the, you know, again, Africa to Asia. It's It has, you know, Gibraltar, it has Suez Canal, it has all the, the major, you know, uh, major waterways connections to the world. Mm -hmm. Again, of course, the Middle East is affected by uh, Middle East now, like uh, all countries of Middle East are developing countries or underdeveloped, actually. They're suffering a lot of um, civil strife, a lot of, you know, instability. And um, again, many of them are trying to stay in the gray area between the East and the West, which might not work for long. So where do you think the, the Middle East uh, the, how do you see the Middle East's future? I think, honestly, the Middle East is now and probably for the next, we want to be optimistic, but let's say 15 to 30 years, is in a position of fighting for its life, essentially is what it is. I think all of these countries are, as you said, they were already at a disadvantage. We've always been placed in that periphery kind of label where it's what we used to call the third world because of the struggle that is there. And now you've added on to it political struggle. Each country has suffered with its own internal political struggle that's had external like factors that played into it. So really a lot of these relationships are the results of what can I do to survive? If Russia is the one that's providing the most promise, the most backing, the most support, if they look like they have the ability to give the most, then I think the Middle East will stay loyal to this idea of we don't want to conform to the West. We don't want to conform to this neoliberal democracy. But at the same time, they benefit from this neoliberal democracy, especially at a time when they're trying to rebuild themselves. Yeah. So I honestly think it's just a matter of who's going to bring the better offer to the table. And the Middle East will eventually be somewhere that both sides are going to have to appeal to because as you mentioned they're really at the center middle east has always been the center playground for all of these stretched out global wars and and the new player china again is is playing you know a big game because uh something that might be very appealing is that china whenever it supports a country it never interferes in its political matters so they never would enforce any kind of regime change or like any form of democracy they're mostly interested in business so they lend you something and it's um okay but uh the interest is very high and mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you fail to pay then you know you you will need to give um some commodities so mm -hmm. uh, some major assets of the country so um, again china might be a big player here mm -hmm. uh Last but never least, how do you see the future of war? Because um, as of the, you know, like uh, after World War II, we had the mad mutually assured destruction, you know, idea that uh, with a lot of nuclear heads spread in the East and the West, uh, nuclear submarines as well. So um, like a, um, a conventional traditional war is almost impossible now. Mm -hmm. uh, there was chemi chemical warfare, but again, it's sort of outdated. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the future now is for biological cyber war? And 
how far will that go, in your opinion? I think that the two main ones are definitely the ones you mentioned. So biomedical. And the thing is, biomedical warfare, it's existed for a while. We don't have to look that far. Even with indigenous communities, you give them blankets that have viruses in order to mass, you know, get rid of a mass number of people and take over. But now we have genetic engineering that's playing a role into biomedical warfare. And essentially, it's this ability they now have to alter the pathogen, alter the virus, alter the disease that you want to not just infect, but also survive, um, fight against any drugs that could be developed to go against it. It's really, it's just taken biomedical warfare to a whole other level. And the problem is, is the attack aspect of it is so much faster than the defense. Because every time something new is produced through genetic engineering, you now have to produce a new solution to it. But once that solution is produced, there's now a new pathogen that you have to develop a defense for. So it's really this, this notion that with biomedical warfare now, we're playing catch up. There's no solid defense. Whereas with you know classic warfare, you knew what you were up against, you knew how to fight it. it, it there was a strategy in place. How do you put a strategy for something you can't see, you don't understand, you don't know? Um, as for cyber attacks, I think that's really the scary one because we've always had nuclear powers as, you know, thing, something that could threaten world war on a, on a huge scale. And as you said, mutually assured destruction, nobody wins in that. But what do you do now when a third party can hack into a nuclear system and essentially trigger a war that was never even meant to happen? So if I'm country X and I want to cause problems between Russia and the United States, what's to stop me from trying to hack into Russia's system to be like, hey, the U.S. is trying to get to you when really the U.S. is doing nothing. And now you've got two countries retaliating and fighting against each other for an unknown threat that they, they can't even see, you can't even perceive. So it's really, I think the scariest part of modern warfare is the anonymity behind it. You don't know how to trace it. You don't know how to understand it. It takes time to study. So really, I think with warfare, what we're moving forward with is the phones in our hands. That's modern warfare. Just the technology that we're producing, you know, drones that have the ability to fly without a pilot from point A to point B and you can't track it. All of these things, I think that's kind of where we're heading with war. And that's what makes Ukraine and Russia, China, Taiwan, all of these possibilities even scarier than what they once were. Absolutely. Uh, Lara, really, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, really looking forward to having you time and again with us. And it's it's really a great pleasure to see, um, you know, people like yourself from the new generation that are very well informed and uh, able to have this great insight. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. And uh, dear viewers, if we were to recap here, actually, um, you know, the Mahatma Gandhi or Mohandas Gandhi once said, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. And I think this is where the, you know, this is the center and the core of the problem. And um, unfortunately, again, like many countries and many systems don't really practice what they preach because they might be very democratic within, but not without, like, you know, not with other countries, they might be democratic with their people, but not, you know, uh, when dealing with international affairs. And um, I think the most important thing that people need to have now is, is more insight, more knowledge, deeper knowledge, because unfortunately, most people know the world to be here and now which is absolutely not true. So to have a bigger perspective, you know, again, it's like the example of, of two people walking in the two opposite sides of, you know, the, the road, and then they see a letter, and one guy says it's an M, the other one says it's a W. Well, guess what? Both are right. Just depends on the perspective. So nobody's wrong. You know, again, a six and a nine. Nobody's wrong. It's, it is a six and it is a nine. So we really have to try to have a more wider perspective. And the more you study human history, 
and the more you know about international affairs, you'd find out that we're extremely similar. Much more than we think and much more than we want even, but we're extremely similar. So I think, you know, like the only solution, the only way out of this, you know, um, endless saga of turmoil and of atrocities is for the people to rule themselves for real. And for them to rule themselves for real, they need to be well informed. Dear viewers, until we meet again, I hope you have a very pleasant time. Thanks for watching.